always great to be back here. 27 years in Poland, sometimes you kind of get distance from your home church, and so I feel as much at home here as anywhere that we are able to travel to. Uh, some of you already know my story a little bit, that I grew up in Houston, uh, a few miles from here. Uh, my wife and I met at Houston Baptist University. Uh, soon after we graduated, we went up to Fort Worth to attend seminary up there. We had enough savings probably for about two months. And uh, so we put everything we had, and, which wasn't much, in our vehicles and traveled up there. And I began looking for work. Uh, could not find any positions in churches in that area. I was applying at lawn services, mow yards, uh, security places. Finally, I got a call for security a company to interview. I'd done that my senior year at Houston Baptist, which means I rode around a golf cart, gave traffic tickets, basically. But uh, they called me in, and I made it sound like it was a lot more than it was. And uh, she said, and I walked through a room full of guys that were interviewing, and she said, oh, I see you have experience. Uh, Can you start on Sunday? And that was one of those moments in life that you'll never forget. Uh, I needed work. Uh, We needed for me to have work. And, uh, but the Lord just gave me a catch in my spirit, and I said, ma'am, I'll work six nights a week if that's what you need, but would it be okay for me not to work on the Lord's day? And uh, she said, that's the, the busiest day we have, and she closed my folder and said, I'll think about it, get back with you, which was her way of saying, you can leave now. And I went out to the car, Susie had been praying in the car, and said, well, did you get the job? And I said, well, I think I did for about two seconds. And uh, we prayed there, and we said, no, it's the right thing to do, and a closed door, and didn't understand, but we got in the car, we drove a few miles back to seminary housing, there a small little duplex, opened the uh, screen door, and there on the, the ground was a, a business card from a pastor, and I picked it up, it had two words on the back, call me, and uh, that church called me to be their associate pastor throughout my, my seminary years, and I share that because that's not unlike, I trust, experiences that you've had, where it just it seems like you're, you're serving the Lord your best, best you can. It seems like you're walking the path that He was leading you, and then all of a sudden, life is interrupted. Uh, I did not have Harvey in mind when the Lord led me to this passage, but I just trust some of you have had a few interruptions in these last few months. But how do we live an interrupted life that is worth living? You may not realize that missions history is actually filled with servants, with missionaries who thought they were on plan B or C, but history teaches us it was God's plan A. Adonair Judson, Adonair and Ann Judson were the first American missionaries in 1812 to head out to Asia. Uh, They boarded a boat as congregational missionaries thinking they were going to serve in India. They began to study the scripture and realize that uh, they did not quite have baptism right in that denomination. And so they became Baptists in that journey. But even more than that, they couldn't go to India. And they went to Burma. And even to this day, 200 years later, the work of the Judsons is seen fruit among the Cotton Burmese. Uh, fast forward just a few years. 1839, David Livingston uh, was on his way to Asia to be a missionary. And yet God redirected him to Africa. And it was Livingston that opened the interior of the continent of Africa to the Word of God. That famous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume that would be him. Fast forward into the last century, 1939, John Allen Moore went to Yugoslavia to open the work of the Foreign Mission Board, now called International Mission Board. Uh, Opened a seminary after just a few short months, and soon after that, World War II uh, broke out. Yugoslavia became communist, obviously, and he had to flee within his new wife never to be able to live there again. And yet God used him to train a generation of European pastors there from Rushlikan. J.D. Huey, 1947, appointed to go to Russia, could not get into the country. Redirected to Spain, became a statesman among Spanish Baptists, and later in life also taught at the seminary in Rushlikan. Our own story, 1990, I was pastoring outside of Dallas, Texas. And uh, the... A lot of circumstances, I was invited to preach a crusade, they called it, in Poland. And so I traveled to Poland, first time I'd ever traveled overseas, preached in a a small city there, and uh, got back home, and Susan and I prayed. We were already in the uh, process with the Foreign Mission Board, and they asked, well, where do you feel led? And we said, we feel God's leading us to Poland. And they said, well, there there are no jobs in Poland. Will you go to Czechoslovakia? And we said, well, we think God's calling us to Poland, but we'll go wherever there's a need. And so they approved us to go to Brno, Czechoslovakia, present-day Czech Republic. And then about three or four weeks later, I'd already resigned the church where I was pastoring. They called to say, all those jobs are canceled. Would you consider Yugoslavia? 
And we're like, you know, I think God's really, this, really calling us to Poland, but we'll go wherever he would lead. And so we went in December of 1990, 27 years ago this week, to, uh, to Richmond for that final interview. And uh, we were appointed in First Baptist Church, Charlottesville, Virginia, in front of the baptistry where Lottie Moon was baptized. I mean, that's got to take if you stand in that place to, to get appointed. But they still didn't know where we were going. And the next day, through a phone call, they said, well, would you be interested in Poland? We said, great idea. And uh, we were the first missionaries with the International Mission Board to go to serve in Poland. Now, I didn't understand, and to this day I don't fully understand, all of the closed doors that led to that. But I began to understand the heart of God, who is sovereign even in those moments. In recent scripture study, I came to a realization that never struck me before, that the very first missionary to Europe did not want to go there. And so things haven't changed that much, even as I'm out recruiting and trying to encourage people. Uh, You may have heard of him. His name's Paul. And uh, his story is found in Acts chapter 16. And so if you have your Bibles, would you please open or power them on to Acts 16. And I'm going to ask you to stand in reverence of God's Word, as I'm going to read just five verses, beginning verse 6 of that New Testament book of Acts, chapter 16. And we're in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey. And verse 6 picks up, and they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian regions, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, which is Asia Minor. And when they come to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when we had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. The first missionary to Europe was trying to go somewhere else, and yet God called him and led him there. Now, a lot of uh, questions remain unanswered from this passage. How? How did God forbid them to go to Asia Minor? Or how did God forbid them to go to Bithynia? And I don't know the answer. Uh, I don't know if it was sickness, maybe unrecorded visions, maybe terrain, maybe literal uh, armies or, or something that were obstacles. But that's not really the main question. It's not the how, but the why. And the why is because God had something greater than even Paul could envision that day. Now, I believe Paul's motives were good to want to go to Asia Minor or to Bithynia, but God wanted to open a continent, and Paul could not have understood that until he had the Macedonian vision. Uh, Now again, you'll see on the screen a map which may help geographically, because I do see some importance in this. Paul was in Lystra, which is the hometown of Timothy, and as he is understanding, we don't know how, but God had led them, you need to go northwest. And so Paul and Silas and his group began that journey. And then one day on that journey, Paul decided, no, I want to go northeast. And we read in verse 6, it says that the Holy Spirit forbade them to do that. And so what does Paul do? Well, the temptation would be, well, I'm not moving until you give me the full next step and final step. But that's often not how God works. But what Paul did was he said, I'm going to stay faithful to the last light you gave me. And he continues, you see on the map, he continued northwesternly, Galatian, Phrygia, uh, toward Mycenae. And then another day he says, you know what, I want to go straight north to Bithynia. And it says there, the Spirit of Jesus did not permit him to do that. So again, he doesn't stop to say, Lord, I don't understand, and, and I have to understand to follow you. Friend, we don't have to understand to follow him. We have to obey to follow him. And he continued, and you see the coastal town on the map, and that's Troas, And that's as far as he knew to go. Well, it's interesting, even looking at the map, from Lystra to Philippi is a good distance. But from Troas to Philippi is not. And I believe there's a lesson there that oftentimes closed doors position us for God's next open door. Now, it can be frustrating. It can be confusing, especially those of us who are type A and we want to plan everything. And there's probably most of us. And yet, through the silence, God builds the character. And so we see Paul going on the last light that he had. I've heard people quote scripture by saying, when God closes a door, he always opens a window. That's actually the sound of music. Uh, it, it, it is a good portrayal, 
uh, of our Lord. Uh, I appreciate Helen Keller's version when uh, she signed, uh, when one door of happiness closes, another opens. But often we look so long at the closed door that we do not see the one that's been opened to us. And I've met people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, planning their life outside a closed door, stubborn saying, God must open this door. And God is wooing them, trying to lead them down a better path that He has for them. Well, who is sovereign? Who is the one that controls access? Well, Jesus self-identifies actually in the book of Revelation chapter 3. That letter, uh, he says, send to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And he writes, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. And then a word to that church. I know your deeds. Behold, I put before you an open door which no one can shut. God is ultimately the one who controls access in our lives. Uh, Sometimes it seems like circumstances. Sometimes it seems like possibly poor choices. And yet God is sovereign to use even those as he leads us. Well, what about closed doors? And I admit sometimes it's difficult to discern. Uh, Even James talks about that uh, God will give trials or God will give tests, but God will never tempt Uh, And and sometimes they look similar. Uh, The difference being the the motivation and the results. Uh, when When we face trials, when we face tests, they're from God to strengthen us, to draw us to Him, to make us more like Him. When we face temptations, they're to tear us down. They're to draw us away from the Father. And again, sometimes they look similar on the front end. But as we walk by faith, God often reveals uh, the reason and the strengthening that He wants to do through us. Much of my life as a missionary has been about seemingly closed doors. Uh, Some of my best friends, Randy and Joan Bell, they arrived in uh, Serbia, Belgrade, back in the mid-90s. After the wall, the Berlin Wall came down, there was a series of of wars, especially in Slovenia. There were six ethnic groups forced together by Marshal Tito. And the Croats and the Serbs, Catholics, uh, Orthodox, were immediately at each other. Well, by the latter 1990s, the Serbs moved on to the Kosovars, the Muslim people of Kosovo, related to Albanians. And systematically, they were killing the Kosovars. Finally, the U.S. intervened and said, desist, and they refused to do that. An ultimatum was given. May 23rd, 1999, at midnight, if you've not withdrawn from Kosovo, we will bomb. Well, the Bells were caught in the middle of that in Belgrade, knowing God had called them there, learning this challenging language, planning their lives Roots were going deep and without any choice. Hours literally before the bombing began, they loaded their small little girls and they drove across the border heartbroken. God had closed that door. And they drove to Maribor, Slovenia, the country, uh, just to the the north and the west. And there they began to unpack, bewildered. We know God led us to Belgrade and we'll probably never get to move back again. And so they began to put life together. In no way could they tell in 1999 that God was going to raise them up to do a great work in Slovenia. A a union, a Baptist convention that had five Baptist churches when they arrived. They're on their fourth Baptist start now. And he's being called the, uh, the William Carey of Slovenia. There's no way he would have known that. And yet that closed door God used to open a country More recently, 2014, the hostilities began in the eastern part of Ukraine between the Russians and the Ukrainians. And uh, there's been devastation. Uh, Our our missionaries there, one has stayed actually, and one had to move because part of his building was actually harmed in the bombing. Well, many uh, Ukrainians have fled. Over a million have come into Poland where we live. Well, there was one Ukrainian pastor, his church building had been bombed. And he opened up a map. And instead of looking west, he looked east. He said, I I speak Russian and I speak Ukrainian. Where can I go to serve the Lord? And he began to survey and to search. And the place with the least Baptist churches, evangelical churches in Russia, it was out in the middle, a place called Udmurtia, Izhevsk, where Tchaikovsky is from. And so he took many children and his wife, and they traveled east through the war zone to Izhevsk and out to a village, unaware that God had already led two of our workers to that very city, and they were starting a church, and they needed a pastor to pastor that church. Now, horrific conditions, tragic, and it's still tragic today in the Donetsk, Lugansk area of Ukraine, but God used what seemed to be a closed door to open wide a door, and now a second and even a third 
church is being started. Closer to home, we have five children. Our oldest daughter served where Paul went that day, a place called Macedonia, there north of Greece. She served two years as a journeyman, and it just happened she met a young man who got her interest, a new believer who pursued her, and she didn't run. And uh, after her term, she went back there to see if this was of the Lord, and they were married, and uh, they're presently living here in Houston. Uh, about four years ago, they got married. A couple years ago, they decided it was time to begin a family, and it, it just wasn't happening. And so they took tests, and uh, there were examinations, procedures, and, and nothing was helping. And just over a year ago, the doctor finally sat down and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but you can't bear children. And our son-in-law said, well, can't. Does that mean 90% we can't, 95% we can't? And the doctor said, no, you're not understanding. It's less than 1% that you could ever carry a child yourself. And she is now in her third trimester as she's expecting little Jordan. And I want to be careful here because I don't want to be misunderstood. God does not always open the doors the way we want him to open the doors. And sometimes he opens the door of adoption or he opens other doors. But in his sovereign will, he opens best doors. And he leads us in best paths. Maybe you've come this morning and you feel that you've been standing outside a closed door. It seems more like a wall. And you've given up hope. In fact, hopelessness is epidemic, I read, in the States these days. People are feeling overwhelmed. And maybe you feel this is not the life that God had called you to lead. And it's an interrupted life. But is it a life worth living? Well, Paul has much to teach us from this passage on open doors or open windows. Though he doesn't know the why, he knows the who. He doesn't know why he can't go to Asia Minor, why he can't go to Bithynia, but he knows who's leading him. And friend, that's the key to our journey I can't tell you'll always understand this side of heaven, some of the paths you've had to walk or some of the paths I've had to walk, but I can tell you the one who's leading you is worthy. Paul knows he is the good shepherd. Uh, You know, Jesus himself said in John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You realize he didn't say, I am the map. Now, you may see a subtlety of difference. It's a huge difference. You see, if Jesus is a map, you get to choose how you get there. You can go this way, you can go this way, but the way, it's the difference between sunlight when you drive in the day and headlights when you drive at night. When you drive at night, you can't see the end of your journey. All you can see is the next hundred yards. But what happens when you drive that? Well, you see the next. And that's the beauty of faith, that you follow the one who is leading and some doors are opening miraculously in the world today. As a missionary, that's one of my uh, high privileges, is to see and to hear stories. Even as we read of a vision where Paul sees a Macedonian and goes there. Uh, I heard a story recently out of Venezuela. There was a, a tribal people where the gospel had never gone. And so our workers in that country, in two or three dugout canoes, put uh, the transformer in there. They put a projector in there, and they took the Jesus film inland into the bush here and as they were unloading they were setting up they put a sheet between two trees on on a rope and uh, these people had never seen a a, a movie a film and so there's great excitement everybody in the tribe came and sat on the ground to watch this sheet and they began the jesus film well one of our our lady workers was telling me later that uh, there into the film she noticed one of the pigs was rooting there on the cable and she realized that wasn't good. And she turned to one of the leaders and said, uh, there's a pig, you know, biting into the cable. And he looked and he said, it's not my pig. And he continued watching the, the video, transfixed by seeing Jesus speaking their language. Well, in God's providence, in the part of the story, when Jesus cast out the demons there in the, in the cemetery, and they ran down the hill, the pigs did, and they ran to the original Bay of Pigs there, well, it was at that moment that the pig finally made contact with the metal inside the cable. So two things happened. One, the pig was shocked, and he runs through the crowd. The second is all the lights go out and the projection stops. Well, in the darkness, the leader's voice is heard by our missionary, tell us how to know this God now. That God used a pig in that situation to open the door for a whole people group where many came to trust Jesus. The other extreme on that spectrum, London. We've had a great emphasis in London the last few years. And there's a man named Carl who's a a leading executive in Lloyd's. And he recently came to faith. And God just put a burden on his heart for businessmen who are very difficult to reach. And he has seen 10 other high execs come to faith in Jesus and has a vision that every business center in London will have a gospel witness. 
or the other extreme immigrants in, in uh, London. We have workers there. A lady from Sierra Leone came to faith. And she came to our workers and said, now that I know Jesus, I want my family back in my home country to know. I'm going in May, this past May. Would you train me? And so they worked with her. And she went for an extended vacation and led 12 of her family members to faith and continued to disciple them via Skype. Or our, our young couple in Lisbon, Portugal, they just finished their first term. And they went there and he began to teach in the seminary there in Portuguese and to work with the local churches one of his assignments to all of his seminary students, go and share with 10 people and invite them to study the Bible with you informally. Uh, a young, shy young lady named Sarah came up and said, nobody will want to study the Bible with me. Who am I to teach the Bible? He said, well, just prayerfully go and see what God does. 18 agreed to meet with her and met with her once or twice. Finally, five continued in a Bible study ongoing. Three of those came to faith and were baptized. One was Rita, who started her own group and saw people come to faith. And so we see doors opening in hearts all around Europe. Some people ask about the refugees. Although it has slowed down some, there's still refugees coming, especially through the southern Greek islands. One such refugee, a Persian, arrived in the last couple of years. Uh, as he came off that makeshift boat, uh, he was given a blanket and said, we give you this in Jesus' name. And he began to ask questions. How can I know more? And he made his way up to northern Greece, to Thessaloniki. And our worker there was going out to the refugee camp and shared with this Farsi speaker. And he came to faith. And he did what every new believer in 2017 does. He took a selfie. And uh, he was standing next to the, the missionary that shared the gospel. And he took his picture. And he made his way on up the refugee highway to Germany where he was settled. Well, God had already appointed one of our other missionaries in Germany to go and to meet with him, unbeknownst to him that our other worker had met. And so he began to disciple this man. He said, oh, let me show you my father in the faith. And of course, it's a friend of our other worker in Germany. And how God is orchestrating those things that seem so unlikely and yet so much like the heart of God. An, uninter or an interrupted life worth living. I came across another article, Love the Life you never wanted. And again, maybe some of you are here today, and if you're honest, you would say, you know, Brother Mark, I was in vacation Bible school when I was a child, that I know God touched my heart, and I promised Him I would serve Him. And now life has gotten in the way, and now you're, you're 20, or you're 30, or you're 50, or you're 60. Others of you may be in college at a camp, said, you know, I, I'm going to be a missionary, and quote, just never got around to it. Maybe some of you said, you know, when I get married, when I get married and I, and I have two kids, then I'm going to do something for the Lord. And all of a sudden now life has gotten in the way and it's 10, 20, 30 years down that road and you realize you've never lived maybe the life that He called you to live. Well, that may seem like bad news, but the good news is today's an opportunity to live the life He called you to live. I close with the final story and it was just in October I was speaking in North Carolina, and I came across a missions pastor there in a church, and he, he told me a fascinating story. Uh, he's a young man, and he and a, a friend were in northern India on a mission trip. It's a Muslim state up there, and they were sharing the gospel without much fruit or interest, but it was the final night, darkness was falling, and they needed to get to the airport, which was in another city. And so they were walking to a taxi stop, which would take them to the nearby city to catch their flight. Well, they'd set kind of a rule of engagement. If anyone greets us, we will talk, stay and talk with them as long as they want to talk. And they were going down a dark alley and were actually surprised when they heard a voice saying, good evening, where are you from? And they met Deepak. And he said, do you have time for a cup of tea? And they said, of course. And so he took them two streets over to a studio. He was an artist. And as they walked into the studio, they began to see his paintings and said he seemed very talented. And then they turned to see a painting that I hope will be on the screen here in just a second that they were not ready to see. And so they looked to this painting and they said, uh, tell us about this one. And he said, I saw this in a magazine. It's my favorite painting. And they said, well, do you know who this is? And he said, no, I have no idea. And they said, would you like to? He said, oh, yes. And they opened God's word to John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And my sheep hear my voice and they know me and no one can snatch them out of my hands. And they began to just share the gospel and his heart was ready and he prayed to receive Christ. And the first thing he did was he called his brother. He said, you've got to come up to the studio because I've heard something you've got to hear. And he came and he confessed Christ 
that night. And a new church has been started. See, the good news is God is still opening doors all around the world. And you may be thinking honestly today that you've missed plan A or plan B or K or L. But I want to remind you this morning that the sovereign God who opens and no man can shut and he shuts and no man can open. He wants to lead you. And you stand at a path. You stand at a crossroads. Literally every day we stand at a crossroad. And the truth is we can leave differently than the way we came. Maybe it was not your intention even to be here this morning, but God has led you here because He wants to lead you from here. And you're going to have that opportunity in just a moment. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And where you stand may be the place where you need to do business with the Lord, or it may be this altar where the pastor or other encouragers will be here. But you need to leave differently than you came and maybe even a different direction than you are headed. And God so wants to lead you, and He's waiting simply for you to say yes. Would you pray with me? And Father, I do thank you. Lord, I don't thank you in the sense that I was enjoying every closed door that I've encountered in my life. And they're often very painful. And Father, I was often confused. But Father, in retrospect, I thank you for what you did in them. Sometimes strengthening me, sometimes strengthening others. And Father, I trust in this crowd today that there are some whose life's been interrupted. Maybe it's, it's Harvey. Maybe it's a, a relationship. Maybe it's laid off work or financial challenges or health. Maybe they've gotten a diagnosis that has really surprised them. But Father, it's not surprised you. And my prayer is that you will speak to our hearts, even as you spoke to Paul. You used a vision to get him to Europe. Father, if that's what it takes, I would pray that. But Father, it may be more the soft whisper of your spirit to each heart. Lord, take this time, whether it's a private decision or one made publicly, I pray that you will reign and you will lead. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.